Well, welcome, guys. My, uh, my talk here is a little bit about why uh, Sony Raw rocks. Why, why you know, what's, what's the deal with this? Um, when I talk to, uh, to, to Kayla about coming up on stage here, and we talked about topics for this. She said, you know, talk, talk about why you like Sony. And, and, and two things jumped out to me. One, as, as a camera and as a company, I love the, the, what Sony's doing with the cameras and the features that are coming in there. Features that I think we can all really use um, and get a lot of today. Uh, I looked at the, the lineup of speakers and I saw a lot of information on that. And then I thought, what was the other thing? The other thing is the actual files. And I know it sounds silly. I'm not going to spend three hours talking to you on this, but Give me 15 minutes to, to talk to you a little bit about why these files are so good and why it's important to you. And I think uh, hopefully when you leave that, you come off with a, a little bit of a light bulb that goes on, on on why some of this really becomes important. So why does it matter? I'll show you a couple photos here, right? These are, these are basically before and afters. So that's a before image. Take a, and, and as you look at these photos, look at the shadows, look at the highlights. So that's before, that's after. Before, right out of camera, after. Before, after. So what do all those photos have in common? It, there was no HDR. I wasn't opening up HDR programs and blending photos together. Um, there, there's no blending layers going on. I'm not, I'm not taking one dark image, one lighting image, and, and blending it together. Um, there's no layers where I'm, I'm selecting something and, and doing drastic changes to it. And there's no filters, all right? There's no, gra there's, there's no I, I use ND filters to slow down the water, but I don't use any graduated filters to darken the sky or anything like that. Um, for, for me personally, things are changing too much and too fast to, to really base a lot of information off of those graduated filters. So there's no filters, there's no blending. What those photos all have in common is that they were one image and they were really just a combination of shadows and highlights inside a Lightroom. And maybe a little bit of a graduated filter after the fact because I, I have more time and I can actually see it and, and really start to hone that in on the image. But that's all. Shadows and highlights, guys. It literally is. It, it's that simple. And that's where, where this stuff to me starts to become important. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about RAW and JPEG um, because I think, you know, how many people in here shoot in RAW? So almost everybody. Um, if you shoot in JPEG, it's fine. You know, take a look at this next image here. If I walk up to that, it doesn't matter what file format I shoot in. We, we don't have, there's no, there's no range of, of highlights and shadows or anything like that that's really going to impact me when I see a photo like that. So I could shoot in JPEG all day long on photos like this. They're going to look just fine. Um, a photo like this, you know, a little bit more range your phone's going to do good, you know? I mean, uh, JPEG's going to be just fine with that. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but the one place where, where I think this really starts to become an issue is when... So when I walk up to a scene like that, there's a lot of highlights. There's a lot of bright stuff going on, right? We have water. Uh, we have all the stuff in the sky. And then if you look up in front of me, there's a lot of dark stuff going on. There's a lot of shadow detail, all right? This is where, number one, light's changing a lot, all right? So it's like you can stand there and you can start to grab filters, you can start to look at histograms, you start to look at highlights, but when you have a camera that has the file quality that, that we've got in these cameras here, you don't have to think about it. And at the end of the day, when, when I'm out there, I, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to look at RGB values. I don't want to look at highlights and histograms and all that stuff on the back of the camera. I want to concentrate on, on what's in front of me because I don't know when I'm going to get back there again. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time to go to these places. And I don't know when I'm going to get back there. So I don't want to think about that. And when I, when I have these cameras in my hand, I'm confident that I can just point it at this and I can take that photo and that I'll have the leeway to do something like that with it. I'll have the leeway to pull the, the, the detail out of the shadows. I'll have the leeway to, to pull that detail out of the highlights. And again, not think about it. To me, when I'm out there shooting, I want to be creative. 
there's a certain amount of techiness involved in this. I, I know, I mean, part of us all have a, just by being involved in this, we have a certain amount of tech in us. But at the same time, I don't think we want it to get in the way of what we're doing out there. I think we want to enjoy the scenes. I think we want to enjoy what happens in front of us and not have to think a lot about it. So let's forget the raw versus JPEG, because I think you saw the examples there. If you walk up to something, there's not a bright sky, there's not anything really dark going on, it doesn't matter. It's one of those times where it isn't. That's where it becomes important. So, so to me, what this becomes about is raw versus raw, right? Is all raw created equal? Um, the best analogy that I have for this is, think of back in the film days, all right? There's all these different films, and you developed a style. You developed a taste for the film that you liked. You could push, pull, process, do different things to different films. And that's why photographers, you know, you see, you see photographers and they go back and they have people have bought tons of, of films so that they can keep it so that in case they can't get it one day. But people developed a liking for a very specific type of film. For me, it's become the same with raw photos. Sounds kind of silly, but think about it. So when I get these photos onto the computer, th this is processing. This is our post-processing stage. And especially, you know, I, I, I can only speak to you about what I shoot, and that I shoot landscape and outdoors. I can tell you that this is a part of it, all right? Our cameras, as good as they are, don't see life as we see them. It's just impossible. So th this will become part of your life. When this becomes part of your life, you're gonna develop a style. You're gonna develop a taste for what you want to do to your photos. Whether you push the shadows, whether you push the highlights, where you push the shadow, where you push the exposure, you're gonna develop that. And so your raw photos, you actually develop a liking and a taste for this thing. And that's, that's kind of what's happened to me over the years. So when I pick up another camera and I go to process those photos, it's like all these things that I've learned they don't fall into that. It's like all of a sudden now I don't have that range. So now I've got to take a dark photo and I've got to take a, you know, for the sky and I've got to take a brighter photo for the foreground and then I got to open up Photoshop and merge them together and do selections and all those different things. And so to me, I have to change, I have to change part of my, my, my processing workflow for those things where when it comes to the files that, that I'm getting out of these cameras, I don't, and I've developed that style. So the best analogy that I could give to it is, is in some ways, it is back to film. Your raw files, they're, it's like a film. It has a different look to it, but there's a lot of similarities to it. So here's an example. I mean, if you look, what did I do to this photo? I mean, I, I opened up the shadows, I pulled back the highlights, and I took that temperature slider and I warmed it up a little bit. You know, a couple of really simple changes. Um, next one here. So this has been big for me. Um, highlights. When we get out there and we shoot outdoors, you know, one of the biggest things that happens is, is we point our camera at something and it sees all this bright light and it automatically pulls back, right? It sees that it pulls back. Well, we can override that a little bit because if it pulls back and I take that shot, what happens? Everything else goes dark and you know, the highlights look good, but there's a lot of dark areas inside of there. And then no matter how good of a camera we have, when you start trying to pull that stuff out, you do, you do risk a little bit of image quality. So what this has really become for me is I, 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 I photograph for the shadows in the photo and I don't worry so much about the highlights because I know that I know that I can look on the back of my camera and that stuff can be blinking at me. Fiery red, don't shoot this. And I know that with one slider, I can pull it back. And that's what we have in these files. That's why this has become, um, to me, a, a very different style of photography. One photo, I don't have to get out there, I don't have to bracket, I don't have to carry a bunch of filters. One photo and I'm able to do what I want with it. Um, all right, so we're getting tip one and tip two all together. Uh, so I was going to leave you with, uh, I was going to leave you with five tips on on your raw shooting, if you will. All right. So tip number one, and uh, and this one's actually really recent. Uh, if you're shooting one of the the newer the A7R2, 
so Sony just came out and released, which is great. I, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, um, they asked me to, you know, what do you like about Sony? I like that they, they're, they're listening. So the A7R 2 came out and immediately everybody said, we want uncompressed RAW and very soon after we got uncompressed RAW. These changes don't take six or 12 months to happen. They come very quickly. So one of them is uncompressed RAW, all right? You can download an update, it sets in your camera and you can choose the uncompressed RAW. Uh, not to get too techy about it, but think about it. There's compressed RAW and there's uncompressed RAW. Which one sounds better? Number two. You have way more control over the highlights than you think. And we've been conditioned over the years, I think, to, to think that this doesn't happen. That if it's blinking at me, that if, if it looks, if I look at that histogram and I see something over on the right-hand side, like, oh, that's bad. We've been conditioned over that. You have way more control than you think over the highlights in your photos. You can overexpose to get the detail in those shadows and pull those highlights back. All right, by how much? Wait for tip number five, because I'll tell you. Um, saw that in that example, all right? That stuff looks like it would be blown out, but I can pull all that detail back. Tip number three, you have way less noise in the shadows than you think, all right? Way less noise in the shadows than you think. So I'm gonna show you an example. All right, dark, dark shadows, right? I, I pretty much, I let the shadows go because I wanted to get some of that sun coming uh, down right over that tree there. So I let the shadows go darker. And I'm able to pull it all up. It's just one slider. It's called shadows. But you're able to get that information back. Here's another example. All right. This was ISO 100 on a different camera. 100. And all I did, I didn't do a lot. I just kind of opened up the shadows, right? I didn't take the exposure from zero and crank it to five. I just opened up the shadows. That was ISO 100, all right? Here's an example from a really good raw file. I mean, it's almost black on the left-hand side. And no matter what I did to it on the right-hand side, I could not get any noise out of there. So that's big. It saves you a ton of time in post. Saves you a ton of time in the field, taking multiple photos, worrying about all the, the technical settings. So to me, you, when, think about this. You hear all the crazy high ISOs. You, you have it, and you can use it, but you'd be amazed at how little noise is actually in those shadows. Uh, tip number four. So I get a lot of questions on this one. You know, all the different programs out there. I can tell you, I, I've used all the different programs out there. Heck, I work for a different software company than this. But I can tell you that when it comes to exposure, shadows, highlights, um, lens corrections, noise reduction, use Lightroom, use Adobe Camera Raw, one of those two programs, th those are the best programs out there for talking about recovering all this stuff that I've been talking about so far. All right, best, best stuff out there. Work for, I work for On One, great programs for effects and portraits and browsing and everything, but, but when it comes to doing those things, it, it's, it's Lightroom or Camera Raw, okay? Tip number five. You're gonna think I'm crazy with this one, but you have to do it, all right? And it goes back to before, I told you how much noise and, and highlight and detail shadows. Um, guys, bracket, get out there. There's a bracketing feature on your camera. I don't care what camera you have. You have a bracketing feature on. If you're just not sure, bracket. Walk away, put your camera down, click, 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 underexpose, overexpose. That way you know one, you got the shot. You're not risking camera settings and messing around with that stuff and you're, you're missing a shot. So bracket. But beyond that, you don't have to go somewhere special for this. Push, test, experiment, pull, do, every crazy setting with your camera to figure out what you can pull back from the highlights, to figure out what you can pull back from the shadows. Do it when you're home when it doesn't matter, right? Go out in your front yard and test it. Go out back, test it. Point up to the sky, point up to the sun, point into dark trees, whatever happens. Crank your ISO up to the highest number that it'll go and see what happens. See what happens with those things so that when you get into that situation where it does matter, 
you know. When you get into that situation where you look on the back of your camera and uh, you know, you're going to take a photo and you look and you think that's going to be a little bit overexposed and it's blinking at you, you walk away comfortable because you know you got the shot. You know you can pull that back. You can crank up your ISO to 6400 because you feel okay about it because you know the photo is still going to look great. So push, pull, test, experiment, mess with all those features on a camera, figure out, learn whatever camera you have, you have to learn it. Whatever camera you have, you have to learn it because at the end of the day, you'll feel more comfortable when you walk away from all those different photo shoots. Okay? So, uh, guys, that's it for, uh, for my quick talk here. If you got any questions, I'm going to let everybody else get up on the stage over here and everything. But uh, I'll, or do I have time for questions? She's like, I got five minutes. I'm going to do what? I'm going to do Speaker 101. What they teach us in Speaker 101 class, never take live questions. I'm going to do it. They tell us never to do this. So anybody, any, yeah. Um, so the question is, is what Sony cameras and lenses do I use? So I use the, currently the A7R2. Um, before this, my favorite Sony was the A7R. I am a, uh, I'm, I'm a big megapixel guy, all right? I'm a big megapixel guy for two reasons. One. Uh, you saw Dennis kind of talked a little bit about before with uh, he's able to crop in. Um, I can shoot, I can get out to, to, I can get out there and I can shoot a little bit looser, all right? Um, I don't have to necessarily get the framing exactly right. And if I decide later I want to crop it, I'll have the, the resolution to crop it. I, I also like the megapixels and this one probably sounds silly. It's fun to edit. We've got these big screens, and whether we can or whether we should zoom in to 200%, we can argue that all day long. It's just fun to do. You know, We spend a lot of time, money, and energy on this stuff, and when you're sitting in that big screen, and you're editing your photo, and you can zoom in, and you can just see the fruits of your labor of getting out there and doing it and see all that detail, it's just a lot of fun. So I'm a, I'm a big megapixel camera guy, so the A7R, the A7R II. Uh, my lens lineup, I'm, I'm minimal with that. So I carry a 16 to 35, 24 to 70, and a 70 to 200. And that's for most of my landscape work. Um, 16 to 35 takes care of most of the really wide stuff. The 24 to 70 is going to be my, my primary landscape lens. The reason being is that for, for a long time I shot with the 16 to 35. And I'd get back from my photo shoots and I wasn't very happy. And what happened, I'd shoot, I'd shoot so wide. And you'd go to these great places and you shoot it at 16. You, you, we can go shoot the city skyline. You shoot it at 16 millimeters, what happens? It becomes that big, right? So I'd go to these great places, I had these great mountains in the background and they'd compress. And so as I started looking at my photography and looking at photos that I liked, I started moving to the 24 to 70. For a portrait photographer, I know a lot of portrait photographers think that's kind of a nothing range for portraits. But for landscapes, 24, if I can't fit it in, I recompose. All right? I figure out a way to fit it in at 24. I just move forward, I move back, but I do it. And then I can zoom in and I can make my scenes a little bit larger. There's times, you know, I went to Yosemite back in May. Um, a lot of the shooting locations in Yosemite, you, know, you have El Capitan up there, it's right in front of you. You need 16 millimeters because you're just not going to get it all in the frame. But the 24 to 70 is probably the workhorse. The 70 to 200 is great for some of the more intimate shots. Anybody else? Two? No. I, think we're, I think we're done. So, guys, thank you so much. If you have any other questions, I'll hang out over on the side over here. But thanks for coming by.